66 feet tall, 240 feet long. My mentor, the late great John Anthony West, would say that it's not only an emblem of Egypt, but it is arguably the greatest sculpture on earth. The Great Sphinx of Egypt, known by many names throughout history. Horamakit, Horus on the horizon. Ra Harakte, the living statue of Ra Harakte. Abul Hol, the terrifying one, the father of terror. Tefnut, the spit of Nut. And recent hieroglyphic evidence has revealed the ancient name of Mehit. And it is my esteemed honor and pleasure to say that we have the ancient mysteries researcher and author, Dr. Manu Saifzadeh, here with us today, who is responsible for putting that work together. We'll hear from him in just a moment. But well, what do we really know about the Sphinx? In the Masonic tradition, the Sphinx is guardian of the secrets, keeper of the ancient mysteries. But for the uninitiated, the Sphinx comes down to us from Greek tradition, where it had the body of a lion, a winged lion, and the head of not a man, but a woman. And she terrorized the citizens of Thebes, the Greek, not the Egyptian and she puzzled passengers with a riddle. What goes on four feet, on two feet, and on three? But the longer it goes, the weaker it be. Devouring all those who failed to answer until along came Oedipus, who realized the answer. The answer to the mystery, anyone? Yes. Was man. It is man who as an infant crawls on all four through the process of growth, begins to stand upright and walks on two. And through old age and senescence, walks with a staff or a cane, effectively has three legs. So Oedipus may have resolved the riddle of the Greek Sphinx, but the great Sphinx of Egypt may still hold a secret. Archaeologists such as Mark Lehner and Egypt, Egyptologists as well, and Egyptologist Dahi Hawass, are convinced that there is nothing more to see here. Move along, all the secrets and everything has been revealed. I'm not entirely certain that's the case. I think there may be more perhaps under the Sphinx. And with that being said, I'd like to introduce our dear friend, Dr. Manu Saifzadeh. Manu, yeah. <laughs> give him a round of applause. Good to see you. <laughs> all right. Okay, well, I am going to take you to where I started my involvement with this. I'm, I was a consumer of ancient mysteries just like everybody else. I was watching National Geographic Channel, and all of a sudden I got involved with this. Okay, how did this happen? Well, I went on a cruise with Robert Boval and Graham Hancock in 2017, and Robert gave me the book Origins of the Sphinx. It's a great book. And I was reading the book, and uh, it struck me that the fundamental problem is with Egyptology is that we don't have a name for this monument in the Old Kingdom. And I'm not the first one who asked this question. Robert Boval tried to answer this question. What was the name of this amazing statue that the builders, supposed builders, called it? And we didn't have an answer for that. So let me show you the names that we do know from Yo. the New Kingdom, right? So come closer. And I am going to give away two books today. And I was just thinking, how can I, you know, make this sort of like a little raffle? And so the first person who tells me where the second name is written, and it'll, it'll be easy to find. You don't have to read hieroglyphics. It's basically a sphinx, little sphinx hieroglyph, right? So it's somewhere on this, in this text. You look at it, and then the first person who tells me where it is. I but, know, I know. <laughs> but so if you look up there, over the head of that sphinx, over the head of that sphinx, you see you see that little folded cloth sign, okay, and then you see the falcon sign, and then you see the horizon sign, right? So that is Hor M Achet. That is one of the names of the great sphinx in the New Kingdom. And the other name, uh, which I'll tell you, it's Horachti. They actually mean very similar things. So Hor M Achet means Horus in the horizon, and Horachti means Horus 
off the horizon. Okay, some people translate it as horse of the two horizons. Okay, so so this is a paradox, right? So we have basically no name in the old kingdom, and then all of a sudden we have two names in. Uh, I'm sorry, we have no name in the old kingdom, and then we have two names in the new kingdom. So how did that happen? And so, in under the Sphinx, I have an answer for this. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I can explain why the names mention Horus when we're actually looking at a Lionite statue, okay? So this is also another mystery, but we have a solution for this now. And I'm going to explain this in a few minutes when we go out. I have a little graphic for you. And then anyway, so you probably heard about this story. This is Tatmos IV falling asleep on this side of the Sphinx. Uh, the sun was in, uh, at the zenith. And then uh, the Sphinx spoke with him and saying that if you free me from the sands, then I will make you king. That's kind of the, the essence of the, the text written here. And so my project began with this. I was basically trying to answer this question. Well, if there was a statue before the Old Kingdom, which is what alternative history historians are saying, then there had to be a name, right? If you, you, in order to make history, you have to have a name. And my answer to this question is that name is Mahit. Why am I saying this? Because we have textual evidence that dates up to five centuries before the time of Kafre that mentions a sitting lioness. And we have a name for this lioness. It is Mahit. There is a sign above this lioness. We called it the jaw sign. And in Under the Sphinx, I explain what I think this means. I have a translation for this symbol. It's not an Egyptian hieroglyph. That's a symbol that comes from the northern part of Egypt. It's a script that is now lost, but some remnants of the script were maintained in the hieroglyphic language. And so that sign, which we call the jaw sign, actually means opener, okay? And so that became part of a title of the most important officials at the royal court. There was only five known carriers of this title. And they had special access to what I think was a library, okay? But it's not a library that you might think is a big room with bookshelves, no. In Under the Sphinx, I reconstruct this to be a portable ark, okay? And that portable ark, at some point, was under this area, okay? And then it was removed and transferred to a different library in Middle Egypt called uh, Hermopolis. This is the city of Thoth. And uh, there was a library there, a special library. And in that library, this ark was most likely stored. And there was information inside of this ark that eventually leaked out into the local cemetery. And I talk about all of this in the book. We don't have to get into it now. But so this is the textual evidence that I put together to add my chapter into this big book of the debate about the date of the Sphinx, right? The dating of the Sphinx. So the other two, of course, is astronomy and geology. And I do want to get into that real quick. Of course, you know, we, Robert Kubala, Robert Schock at length have spoken about this, and I, and I don't want to speak about it on the, in their stead, but I just want to give you a little bit of a summary, okay? So, first of all, as you all know, we're looking due east, okay? Now, I have some news for you. There is nothing about due east that the ancient Egyptians cared about, okay? You may have heard otherwise, but the evidence does not show any there's no suggestion whatsoever that the ancient Egyptians cared about Due East. So this is an anachronism in and of itself, that this statue does not belong into this culture, okay? That orientation mattered to another culture. And um, so that's the Due East. But so Robert Bouval, of course, as you know, he reconstructed this to point at uh, the constellation Leo. And how did Robert conclude this? Well, he looked at this stela, and he said, well, there's two sphinxes here, right? They're, you know, back to, sort of, like an, uh, like a back-to-back -back sphinxes looking opposite direction. Is that just artistic uh, mirroring? But Robert thought, no. He thought that one is the sphinx on the ground, Horemachet, and the other sphinx is the sphinx in the sky, and that's Horachti. And so, and how did he conclude that? Well, he thought that this depiction of Tatmos with the libation jar is, a, is actually Aquarius, okay? So he figured that this must be, there's astronomy, astronomy involved. And what, what we're looking at here is one sphinx in the sky and one sphinx on the ground. So this is how Robert put this together. He thought that Horachti is the sphinx in the sky. And the pyramid texts, of course, talk about Horachti. And so Robert felt that was probably the name of the sphinx in the Old Kingdom. It was Horachti. And Horemachet was the sphinx on the ground, OK? I want to show you something. 
that is the Egyptologists themselves have unearthed. Here is a wooden plate. There you see something that looks like a square temple. And look there, there's a lion, mm. a lion stat, something as big as a temple. And guess what? This is 500 years older than Khafre. It's the old oh. kingdom, right? So this is a Flinders Petrie found this. And for comparison, right, I have a photo here. This is from up the mountain here, Gebel Ghibli. So that's what, what you would be looking at now. You see the Sphinx and you see the temple in front of it. And that is basically what an, uh, a, a tourist might have seen 5,000 years ago, taking a Polaroid picture from that up there. They would have seen this and that, okay? Now, this is evidence that the Egyptologists have had in their backyard, but they're not using it. I don't know why. Can't explain that to you, okay? Now, one more thing I wanted to say, the names. Okay, so here's Mahid, by the way. That's the jaw sign, that's the opener. Here is how you get the two names of the Great Sphinx. So remember, I said that Horem, Achet, and Horachti have to do with Horus, right? How does, how does that relate to a line? Well, this is the person, Mary, who was alive under Kafre. He was a scribe of Mehit. Here's the, the right side of his famous architrave. This is at the Met in New York. And here's the other side. And there you see the only, evident, the only example of this title, the who, who, two Horuses in the desert. Mm. Herui, I'm Chasti, okay? And guess what? You can get both names out of that title. Heru, Achti, or Achti, mm. and Heru, M, Achet, or M, Achet, okay? That's where the two names come from. This is how I'm reconstructing it. So this is Old Kingdom. That's when the new cult started. The Sphinx cult replaced the Mehit cult. A man, a, ma a male statue, an anthropomorphic statue replaced a female lioness statue. Yeah. The greatest identity theft in the history of mankind. <laughs> that is what Robert Nealon says. Robert Nealon's the award-winning sculptor that we yes. referenced earlier. He's right on the money. Okay, it's an identity theft. Oh. This is a crime scene. <laughs> Anti-feminist. Anti-feminist, yes, yes. Yeah. The, this was a female statue, wow. yes. So this is how, and this is so obvious, right? I don't understand why this was never discovered. I'm, who am I, right? I'm just a dermatologist, okay? I'm a, somebody who watched Nat, Nat Geo, Discovery Channel. I watched NEXT maybe a few years ago, and I got into this and I'm stumbling over all this. So, so should you, you should ask questions. Stop watching TV, research. Okay. And here is yeah. hieroglyphics, like this yeah. newspaper. You teach yourself astronomy, geometry. Hieroglyphics, okay? Learn it, start investigating. You will find some amazing stuff because other people don't want to. Yeah, I, I think that's an important lesson yeah. for all of us to, you know, you don't want to just accept something. Don't even take our word for it. Go out and research for yourselves. See what resonates with you within and, and verify what you're reading. Go to the sources. You, you have your favorite alternative authors. Look at the sources they cite and read those sources and read their sources if, it, if you feel called to you know, verify the evidence for yourself. But I understand not everyone is compelled to do that. And that's why sometimes we need filters and trusted sources. And that's why we should all subscribe to my YouTube channel. This way, everyone. Thank you for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please give it a like, leave a comment down below to let us know your thoughts, and please subscribe for more content like this. If you appreciate the content that I'm putting out here on this channel, you can help support at Patreon. I'll leave a link in the description below. You can also support by becoming a member of ancientegyptmysteryschools.com where I offer exclusive footage not available on this channel. And as always, you can join one of my Adept Expeditions Tours of Egypt. To learn more about that, you can visit adeptexpeditions.com. I will provide links for all of this in the description down below. Until next time, this is NEXT for Adept Expeditions. Yeah.